In this video tutorial, we're going to be talking about quantum gates, which is how we perform operations on qubits. So quantum gates can be represented by matrices. When we apply them to qubits, changes the state of those qubits. Now, to see this, we're going to work with a number of the quantum gates on the quantum simulator. And to start off, we're going to look at a gate we've already looked at a little bit, which is the Hadamar gate. So here's the matrix representation of what a Hadamar gate is. It applies this matrix to qubits as they pass through the gates. And this ultimately puts the qubits into superposition, which can be represented by this equation. What it means is essentially that the qubit has an equal probability of being either a zero or one when we observe its, uh, its, its eigenvalue. Now, let's take a look at this again by applying it on the quantum simulator. So when we run the Hadamard gate, we see, just like last time, that we have a 50% chance of observing either a zero or one in different universes. So in half the universes, we'll measure a zero, and then the other half will measure a one. So what the Hadamard gate essentially does is put the qubit into superposition. You can think of it as something similar to the beam deflector that we talked about in the last tutorial video. Now before explaining some of the other gates, it's first important to go over what's called the block sphere. Now we can represent qubits by their poly matrices, um, the matrices we saw on the, the last page with the Hadamard gate. But writing all these matrices out can get a bit tedious, especially when we start dealing with a whole lot of qubits. These matrices can get very big and difficult to work with. So what quantum computer scientists do is they like to represent qubits by this block sphere. By representing a qubit by this equation, we get this nice understanding of a qubit by being able to represent it by how it rotates within this sphere. So it has an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis. And the next quantum gates we're going to look at end up rotating the qubits around this axis. So these gates are what's called the poly gates. Now, the poly gates, there's three of them. There's the, the x poly gate, the y poly gate, and the z poly gate. And what these do is essentially end up rotating the qubit around either the x-axis, the y-axis, or the z-axis. And we can see the actual uh, rotations that they make right here. So flipping a qubit around the x-axis keeps the x-axis the same, but makes the z-axis the inverse of itself. So let's look at that on the, the quantum simulator. So if we apply a x gate right here, this is what's called the not gate, the poly not gate. So when we run it, we see that it inverses the state of the qubit to be 1. Now. When we do this with the Y gate, we see that the same thing occurs. The state is still, that you're measuring it, it's still going to be in a 1, especially because we haven't put it into superposition yet. We can see that the complex number, the essentially the block sphere, what this is representing, does end up changing. Now, let's apply this Z gate and run it again. And we see that there's actually no change. So because we're actually observing the, the z values um, and rotating the, the z value around itself isn't going to end up changing it at all. But we'll see, once we start combining these circuits together, these different gates together, we will be able to make um, calculations as a result of that. So the next gates we're going to look at are called the phase gate and the phase rotation gate. And what these do is they leave the basis state of a qubit unchanged, which is 0, but they map a, a complex number 
to the one value, which has the effect of, of leaving the expectation value of a qubit unchanged, but allows us to, to rotate a qubit in the block sphere uh, or change the phase of it. And this allows us to create complex superpositions after we put qubits through, through the Hadamard gate. So here's the matrix for a phase gate, and here's the matrix for a phase rotation gate, where we're able to, to rotate a qubit in any ratio we want. So we could rotate it half a rotation, or a quarter rotation, or an eighth rotation. So let's see an example of that on the simulator. So if we apply a, a phase gate to, to this qubit, we see that its expectation value is 100%. This, this phase gate doesn't change that at all. But if we are now to apply a Hadamard gate and then apply the phase gate, we still see that the, the expectation value doesn't change. But as we apply these phase gates, we see that this complex number is changing. And, and this represents the position of the qubit within the block sphere. So if we, if we apply these phase rotation gates, which are the, the ratio gates which I was talking about earlier, here's the, the half rotation, we see that once again, the complex numbers are changing, but the expectation value isn't. And we can do the same for the quarter rotation and the eighth rotation as well. And you can see how this is changing the complex number of the qubit, which is representing how it's rotating in the block sphere. And by changing its phase for more complex algorithms, we're able to solve different equations, as, as we'll see in upcoming videos. The controlled NOT gate is a bit different from the other quantum gates we've been looking at since it requires as input two qubits and it outputs two qubits as well since all quantum gates have to be reversible. And how it works is it flips the bit of a second qubit so it NOTs it depending on the value of the first qubit. So if we run this on the, the quantum simulator, we put a controlled NOT gate in like so, and we we run this, we see that the output is 0, 0, because the indicator value for this qubit isn't on, and it isn't telling the second qubit to, to flip. But if we now turn the indicator qubit to 1 and run it again, we see that, indeed, this bit has now been flipped from 0 to 1. And if we turn this qubit to 0 and run it again, we see once again, it has indeed flipped, and if we turn the indicator value on, we see that now the bit no longer flips. So that's how a, a controlled NOT gate works. And the next gate, a, a swap gate, just like the controlled NOT gate, also takes as input two qubits and outputs two qubits. And how it works is pretty similar to how you might expect from how it sounds, in that it swaps the value of the two qubits. So we put a swap gate in here like this and we run it. You see that sure enough the values of the, the qubits have flipped. And if we were to, to try it again with them reversed, we see once again the, the values of the qubits have swapped. If we run 1-1, one, one, they, they have swapped, but since they're the same it looks like there's no change. And if we run 0-0, zero, zero, they've also swapped here. So that's how a, a swap gate works. So that's an overview of how quantum gates work. You can see they're very similar to the gates used in classical computing, except that we can put qubits into superpositions and then perform operations on it while it's in superposition. We'll see in the next video how we can use these quantum gates to create an algorithm to solve certain questions faster than we can with classical computers.